and welcome everyone to this webinar on understanding children's well-being in a digital world. My name is Sonia Livingstone. I'm a professor in the Department of Media and Communications at the London School of Economics. And I'll just say before uh, we begin, uh, thank you to those who are attending. So uh, here in the Department of Media and Communications, uh, Dr. Maria Stoilova, you can see Maria here. Um, Maria and I have a series of linked projects on children in the digital world. Uh, we've been researching children's data and privacy online, uh, Global Kids Online, uh, jointly with UNICEF, um, Y Skills, a new Horizon 2020 uh, youth pro uh, skills project. I run a Parenting for a Digital Future project and blog. And I'm Deputy Director of the Nurture Network, which is a UKRI funded network examining how the digital world is changing the way young people interact with family, school and peers and the implications for their mental health. Maria and I lead the theory work package of a new uh, European Commission funded Horizon 2020 network called CORE. CORE stands for Children Online Research and Evidence. And today's webinar is really part of that work. The CORE is a European Commission funded coordination and support action. It began earlier this year and will run for three years with partners from nine European countries, along with others from and beyond the EU Kids Online network. CORE is led by the Hans Bredow Institute and is creating a pan-European knowledge platform on the experiences of children and young people in digital communication spaces with the participation of researchers, educators, policymakers, and other key stakeholders. So today's theme is well-being, and well-being has become a bit of a buzzword, it seems. Actually, we've been amazed by the popularity of this theme, just judging by how many people have uh, signed up for today's webinar. And we want to ask, what is well-being? I think we refer to it when we want to talk, often in rather ambitious terms, about what society should aim for and what we hope for, for children growing up in a digital world. Improvements in well-being is how we assess the success or failure of policy interventions. The idea of well-being brings together the desired outcomes from health, psychology, economics, many other fields. And if we could agree on its definition and measurement, it might give us a way to track social improvements. For instance, it's often hoped that, we could, that if we can manage children's internet access, strengthen their digital skills and literacies, enhance their online opportunities and minimize or mitigate risks, and if we could also guide parents, children, uh, parents, teachers, and others to support children's digital experiences in constructive ways, then we imagine children's well-being in the digital world would result. But perhaps children's well-being in a digital world result, uh, depends on other things as well. And to think about this, we need to figure out what is well-being, whether we're all talking about the same thing, and how does it relate to cognate terms like happiness or health, quality of life, agency, resilience? Why is well being somehow harder to define than its opposite mental ill health, anxiety, depression, exclusion? Is well being a feature of the individual or the community, the whole society perhaps? For instance, can some of us have well being while others around us suffer? And if we understand it in individual terms, what's it made up of? Emotional, physical, social well-being, perhaps digital well-being these days. So in this webinar, we're going to try and understand well-being with a particular focus on the digital world and particularly in relation to children. Well, the recent public debate has centered on questions of children's mental health and the particular challenges posed to this by social media, our goal today is broader. We want to explore different perspectives on children's well-being, pinpoint areas of consensus or disagreement, and identify what intellectual and empirical work is needed next. So today we have four amazing speakers to help us address these questions. 
They come from different perspectives, experiences and disciplines and deliberately so. Because our aim is to explore and contrast these approaches to well-being across the social sciences and to consider what can really help us in understanding children's well-being in a digital world. Maybe we can draw from all these different perspectives, maybe there will be some gaps or some conflicts. So I'm going to introduce the speakers in the order that I've asked them to speak uh, briefly. So David Schmahel is a professor at Masaryk University in the Czech Republic a member of the interdisciplinary research team on internet and society, which researches socio-psychological implications of the internet and technology. And he has a current project on well-being, as well as being editor of the journal Cyber Psychology. Thanks. Oh. Hello. <laughs> Dr. Richard Graham is a consultant, child and adolescent psychiatrist and former clinical director at the Tavistock Clinic and is currently the clinical lead for Good Thinking, London's digital mental well-being service. And he's worked extensively on digital health and e-safety for the last um, decade. Hello. <laughs> Kitty Stewart is Associate Professor in Social Policy and Associate Director of the Centre for the Analysis of, Dig of Social Exclusion at the LSE. She is um, originally an economist and has worked um, at the in a UNICEF Innocenti Research Centre before joining LSE um, some years ago. Professor Laura Lundy is co-director of the Centre for Children's Rights in the School of Social Sciences, Education and Social Work at Queen's University, Belfast, Northern Ireland, and is joint editor-in-chief of the International Journal of children's rights and her expertise is in law and children's rights. So we've asked each of the speakers to speak for five to seven minutes and after that I'll have some follow-up questions and in the meantime everyone is invited to pose questions using the Q&A function on Zoom which is um, at the bottom of your screen and Maria Stoilova as our discussant is going to be watching your questions and put these uh, to the speakers later. So I'm going to uh, invite them to speak in turn and um, most but not all of our speakers have slides so I shall um, move those on for them. Yes, so you can go directly to the next slide please. So hello. Uh, Maybe I could say that my background is uh, psychology, but now I work at the Department of uh, Media Studies and also Faculty of Informatics. And I think we can say that uh, well-being is a very interdisciplinary term and each of uh, discipline is approaching the term from different perspectives. There are a lot of general definitions for on well-being actually, uh, I can read one of them. Well-being is a multidimensional construct incorporating mental, psychological, physical and social dimension. There are actually also, you could find articles which are giving overview of well-being definitions. So there are really a lot of them. Uh, in our work, we use the definition of World Health Organization, which is dividing well-being to physical, psychological, or mental and social well-being, but uh, we can speak also about cognitive or economic well-being. For physical well-being, we can define it, define it as the presence of health, absence of disease and good physical functioning. Psychological well-being, the presence of positive affect and evaluation and absence of negative affect. And social well-being, the quality of an individual's relationships with others in general. I think you read these definitions. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, here I selected uh, some of indicators which we can use for psychological, physical and social well-being. It is actually from that article of Pollard and Lee. And there are much, much more constructs and indicators uh, which we can use for uh, all the mentioned well-being. I selected just some which are maybe uh, less known, some of them. 
such as for psychological well-being, adjustment, attachment, autonomy, cheerfulness even, competence, emotional adjustment, expectancy for success, happiness, positive mood, purpose in life, self-esteem, and so on. For physical, it could be also physical abuse, physical symptoms of illness, nutrition, uh, eating-related measures. And for social well-being, antisocial behavior, peer problems, family relations, pro-social values, and so on. Uh, for each of well-beings, there are many other indicators which we can use. Uh, what is uh, in common, I think, that uh, the well-being have both the positive and negative indicators. So it is not that well-being is only a positive thing, but it, it has also the negative aspects. But typically, both are measure, uh, constructs are measuring one of these. I think important question is if we need agreement, what is uh, well-being uh, across different disciplines and across different uh, research? My answer would be no, as I indicated on the slide, because I think that uh, we need to think about the well-being in the context in the context of our research question, in the context of the discipline, in the context of the uh, research uh, which we are doing. I will tell you example on the next slide, maybe. Next slide. Well, this is my last slide, that it is actually a model which we developed with my colleagues for the project Future which is uh, focused on impact of technology on well-being. I have to acknowledge that this model is uh, based on the DSM model of uh, Valkenburg and Jochen uh, and uh, remade and revised for this purpose. Uh, we can say that uh, we could speak about short-term and long-term effects of well-being, uh, of technology on well-being. I think this is very important because, for example, if we speak about uh, excessive internet use or online addiction, certain online activity can have a very positive short-term effect on the individual well-being or psychological well-being. But from the long-term perspective, the impact uh, of excessive internet use uh, might be very negative. So these effects, short-term and long-term, uh, could differ a lot. And uh, we should use uh, different research techniques and different research design to investigate the short-term or long-term effects on the well-being. On the side of suspectability variables, uh, we can speak uh, on the left. Uh, I, I cannot use the mouse, I think, but maybe Maria could show all the, uh, each time what I'm speaking about. <laughs> Uh, we can speak about individual level var variables, uh, such as demographic of the si child, but also digital skills, for example, which we investigate in the mentioned uh, Y skills uh, project, uh, New Horizon 2020 project. We can speak about social level indicators, for example, relationships in pe with peers, relationships with family, education, relationships with community but also socio-economic status and all the related variables but we can speak also about country level indicators such as uh, level of technology in the country cultural indicators values or uh, state of the media in the middle there are online activities so this uh, Suspectability variables have direct effect on online activities, which are actually risks or opportunities. As we know, risks and opportunities are interconnected and we cannot divide them into two groups, such as one activity, for example, meeting stranger online is in the same time opportunity because you can make a new friend and uh, it is also a risky activity because it can cause the harm. And uh, the effect of this activity uh, has certain effect on the short-term well-being and also long-term effect on well-being. Uh, it is also needed to take account that there are reciprocal effects of the well-being, such as um, 
mentioned example with excessive internet use. If the adolescent uh, is uh, using the internet in an excessive way, it has also recipro reciprocal effects from the, uh, let's say, uh, emotional, higher emotional problems and he or she is behaving, for example, more risky also online and it can have also impact on some of uh, suspectability var variables. For example, we know that digital skills are uh, positively related to excessive internet use. So, and uh, we can say perhaps in longitudinal research, what is, what is the, uh, what is first, what is the direction of that effect. So, uh, concerning the methods which we should use, uh, I think it's clear that if we want to discover effects on well-being, we should use longitudinal research uh, in, uh, in uh, researching long-term effects, but also it is important to use experimental research from my perception to investigate also short-term effects on the well-being. Well, I think my time is over. I could speak long about this, but I think it's time to give where to other speakers. Brilliant. Thank you uh, very much, David. And um, I think you've already kind of opened with a whole set of variables and considerations that we need somehow to uh, keep in play. Um, I'm, I'm curious about whether the other speakers will be provoked that we um, perhaps don't all need to come to an agreement on what those what those different factors are or what um, what might be included within uh, well-being but we'll we'll see how others um, respond. I'm going to turn to um, Richard Graham now who I believe does not do either experiments or longitudinal surveys so um, but gains his um, insights into uh, questions of well-being and um, mental ill health really from a health perspective. So um, Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sonia. And yes, I, I'm very much a pragmatist and very much sort of involved with what I can learn in the immediate moment. On saying that, if we move to the next slide, I've been on a journey over the course of my career, I guess as many of us who are trained in the identification of health disorders, their symptoms, their signs, recognize that a lot of public health measures usually have a greater impact on someone's life than immediate medical care. And so I had a turning point about 10 years ago, I, I think it was when Gregor Henderson from Public Health England introduced me to the work of Corey Keyes and the notion of flourishing and how that was distinct from the concept of the presence or absence of mental health problems. And so this sort of, um, unipolar sort of view of, of well-being in contrast to, as you pointed out at the beginning, Sonia, issues of illness such as depression or anxiety really changed. I, I, the, my thinking, I think it was always implicit in child psychiatry because of our developmental sort of interests and perspectives, but nonetheless it was a bit of a game changer to discover this. If we then move to the next slide, um, a couple of years ago, I was trying to get interest from a number of sectors around how we might investigate um, the well-being of young people in their use of devices, and that was particularly in the context of working with the BBC on the ONIT app, which itself was aimed at promoting the well-being of young people. And it was very difficult to get any engagement on this then. Um, and I think there are a number of challenges, and working with Emmy Fulton, who was a Coventry University at that point and Tim Chadbourne and Natalie Gold at PHE, um, it was very clear that the exploration or research into the well-being of, of young people and especially children was very limited. So some early studies showed that it was rather sort of um, focused on particular areas like well-being and uh, life satisfaction or negative mental health and the two as indicated before are not the same. There was a real absence of, of scales that measured children's well-being at all. In fact, at that point, pretty much, there was nothing for those under 13 years beyond the Good Childhood Index. Um, and Little and Carter took um, that up and, and uh, developed a scale, the, the Sterling scale, which was an evolution of the uh, good work from Warwick and Edinburgh on the WEMWEB scale. If we go to the next slide, 
Now, when David was talking about agreement uh, and what is well-being, I do think time and context of, of where we are at this moment also makes um, a considerable difference. The Sterling scale, which was something we were exploring in, in terms of you, uh, young people's use of the internet and technology as a way of capturing and tracking changes dependent on use, etc., cetera, um, seemed to be one of the best options at the time. If you look at some of the wording on this now, um, in a time of lockdown, I like everyone I have met or I've been feeling calm, <clears throat> it seems to me that potentially some of the ways we construct uh, models of well-being and the, the sort of dimensions of it, if asked at this moment, would appear at best insensitive and certainly out of touch. So the next slide, please. This raised for me, reviewing it at this time, a number of challenges. Um, one is the problem that we still have, that as children are developing, they are developing cognitively, and their ability to recognize and be in touch with what they're feeling, we, we recognize in, in child development very clearly. But we still have a problem that there is nothing for under eights in terms of uh, a standardized scale and, and rather questionable scales between eight and 13. And that remains a challenge. And it seems astonishing that there's no further progress. The other areas is positive psychology in that language is clearly very helpful for people who are in that sort of better state on the whole. Um, and it seems to me it doesn't really work so well in a crisis uh, as we're in at the moment. And it certainly wouldn't be particularly relatable, perhaps even again insensitive for those with mental health problems, developmental problems like autistic spectrum, attachment disorders, or for those struggling with inequality. And so there's something about thinking about how we might have different ways of considering those areas. And that's where I guess the importance of resilience and helping people self-care in the short term, perhaps as a prelude to thinking about longer term goals of well-being. And final slide, please, Sonia. So last thoughts. Um, I think scales that should, we should be developing now, as we've been trying to do with Partnership for Young London and our project with TikTok, should actually be also developed in a way that do in their own way um, help people answer questions that are more relatable for what they're struggling with that we might also hope to develop scales that actually are in themselves an intervention like a good health assessment can be. It can be a stimulus to problem solving and skills building. Um, and finally, just to end on, it, this all threw me back to questions about what we're trying to achieve and notions going back to Freud's classic paper on inhibition, symptoms and anxiety, where the role of emotional life is in terms of enabling young people to develop and flourish in a way that really does lead to that better well-being. And I think I'll stop there and um, wait for further thoughts. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Richard. I think you kind of take us into um, some of those questions about the different contexts that different young people are engaged with, and they can be very different and very important in um, helping us to frame or even identify what well-being might be. And that um, importance of context really poses some challenges to uh, how we can make generalizations. Well-being in general is this or that, but um, the researcher and indeed the policymaker's tendency is often to make exactly those kinds of, of generalizations. So um, some, some interesting challenges there. Um, I'm going to turn now to uh, Kitty, and I hope you are all um, thinking of questions that you, uh, those who are listening, who might want to ask on the Q and A. Uh, and I'll turn to Kitty. And Kitty, shall I stop sharing so we can see you? I will. Sure. Okay. Good. Um, so, so uh, my interest uh, is in how socioeconomic inequalities affect children's well-being and their opportunities. What do I mean by well-being? I don't think I disagree with, with anything that's been said, but if I had to write a list of what I would include under that, it would be start from the basics. It means having enough to eat. Uh, it means having warm, safe housing, shoes and a warm winter coat to go out in. It means uh, having the opportunities to play and enjoy being a child and to be included and part of society and doing the other things that other children are doing. 
It means, of course, being loved and appreciated. And it must also include having the opportunity to, to flourish and to develop one's talents and abilities. So uh, childhood is a key part of life in its own right. And I think sometimes we forget that, but it is also a preparation for the rest of life and what happens in childhood matters. So development as well is key. Um, and in my work, I focus heavily on economic inequalities, on poverty and as it affects children because we know that living in poverty is not the poverty is not income is not the only thing that matters clearly um, but it does really matter for all of the things that I've just um, set out um, it matters for children's lives right now it matters for their development and for their future lives um, and we also know by the way that it needs a lot of attention so in most EU countries more than one in five children live in poverty and in some countries like this one the UK child poverty rates are rising very rapidly so um, I think the measurement issues um, about how to capture well-being are interesting and important, but I think sometimes it can distract us from getting on with identifying some of the things that matter and, and getting on with doing something about them. So in the rest of my time um, that I've got left, I wanted to set out why I think economic well-being is so important, focusing on thinking about children in a digital world specifically. Um, so I'm going to make two points, maybe rather obvious ones, but the first one, the most obvious one, is that the level of family resources clearly really shapes the level of digital access that is available to children. And it's been really interesting to see this play out uh, during the current lockdown and the closure of schools and the huge inequalities in the type of replacement schooling that children are experiencing um, between private and state schools and also huge range within state schools. Uh, as well. So some schools providing daily online face-to-face -face teaching like this via Zoom, uploading work, sharing work online. And at the other end there are schools that simply put up a list of tasks uh, on a website and children um, copy those tasks down and complete them in an old-fashioned exercise book. And I know that some of those latter, that, that last group of schools are really, really good schools. This isn't laziness. This is really the result of careful thinking about what is the best way to meet the needs of the children that they are catering to. So lockdown is a really unusual situation. It's not the norm, but I think this has been interesting in sort of bringing to the fore and shedding light on the sorts of inequalities that are taking, taking place in a much more hidden way uh, year round uh, in terms of what children can access and what's available. Um, it, it raises, a, I think I'm going to run out of time, so I'm not going to talk about uh, a question about how we address those inequalities, because there's a question there about whether we simply give everyone broadband and we give them laptops, and, and that's the issue, that's, it's the actual access itself, and that's been some of the policy uh, approaches that have been taken, um, which are interesting. Um, just giving laptops, obviously, in its own right, that's been tried by our government, it's, it's been clunky, and it's clearly not enough if it's partly about broadband access. Um, but you know, we could give broadband access, we could, uh, would be one way of doing this and ensure more equitable access to technology. But my second point is that these inequalities uh, between children aren't only about access to equipment and to the technology itself, uh, because we know that poverty and um, um, poverty is damaging to children's lives, uh, not only because of what families can afford, but also because what it means of what it means for parent stress, their anxiety, and levels of depression in families. Um, and so economic well-being immediately affects other aspects of well-being in the household in ways that are obviously problematic. If you have a mother who's depressed, that's one of the worst things for, your, for, your, for all sorts of your um, aspects of your life. Um, and it also matters in relation to the digital world specifically, I think, as well. So if digital technology offers children the greatest gains, if they're not simply free to access it whenever and however they want, uh, but they're accessing it in a way um, that is scaffolded to provide them with protection or structure while they're exploring, um, well, then that involves at least some active parental involvement and engagement and supervision. And we know from research that that kind of engagement is much harder if there are all sorts of other things that parents are worrying about. If you're worrying about what's for tea today or tomorrow or Friday and what you're suffering from, from depression, then the likelihood is you're not going to be doing that kind of interaction with your child, that sort of scaffolding, but 
you're going to be much more relaxed about your child playing on their phone on your phone whenever they want to being up half the night chatting on social media and so on so there's an issue about financial resources and access but there's also one about the lack of financial resources and, and stress so poverty could be linked to digital exclusion but it also could be linked to digital overexposure or the wrong the wrong sort of exposure um, so that's uh, I think I'll leave it there but my the underlying point being that um, economic tackling economic well-being is really at the heart of a lot of the other things that I think we're going to be talking about today brilliant thank you Kitty and um, yes it's useful for uh, I mean I don't know if psychology and economics are at kind of extreme ends of the, the, the spectrum in the, in the social sciences or maybe uh, maybe not. I'm very glad to kind of have these different perspectives and actually to hear the connections in, in, in what people say even though they come from from different different perspectives. Um, so I think uh, I'm interested to consider how far there's a kind of normative uh, question in relation to well-being and so I'm going to turn to Laura at this point because I think that the rights framing um, really kind of takes us into the question of what well-being children should have and enjoy. And um, I'm going to uh, share my screen uh, to uh, return to her um, slides at this point. So thank That's you, Laura. Th thanks, Sonia and Maria. Can, can we go to the next slide? Yeah. Um, I think I'm, a, I'm an outsider in the conversation because I'm not a well-being researcher and I don't see myself as a well-being researcher and I think this will uh, come through in what I'm about to say and that is that um, Sonia mentioned at the start that well-being is a bit of a buzzword and I think the phrase uh, ch child well-being and children's rights is a bit of a buzz phrase if I can use that term it's used increasingly in academic circles and it's also used in practice and I find that phrase really troubling, uh, this pairing of children's rights and children's well-being. And I think why I find it troubling is when I read um, some of the well-being literature, I see claims about children's rights and child well-being, and in particular a claim that well-being is the realisation of children's rights. And I think that can be true, but it's not necessarily true. And that's what I want to unpick today in my understanding of well-being from a child rights perspective. So next slide, please. So I want to say something about children's rights because I realise that isn't a frame that everyone knows or is interested in or understands. And to make the point that it's actually something really different from well-being, it comes from a different disciplinary background, it's a different rationale and scope. I work within children's rights law, human rights law, and I want to be really clear that what we're talking about children's rights, we're talking about politically negotiated compromises. They're agreed with states, by states, for states, and it's all that they're prepared to be held accountable for. So while well-being, and I've, I've heard some of those phrases today, that well-being, we want children to experience joy and flourishing, children's human rights don't attempt to address that. It, it might be a knock-on effect if, if their rights are realized, but not necessarily so. And as Henry Shu has said, human rights define the lower limits of tolerable human conduct. They're not about great aspirations and exalted ideals. They're much narrower than that. So they're narrower than well-being. And again, someone mentioned the right to be loved, or sorry, love as an aspect of well-being. Well, a child does not and cannot have a right to be loved because a state can't love anybody and a state can't make anybody love anybody. And states can only uh, promise in human rights law to do what's achievable by them. It's the same with health. It's, uh, a child in a state of well-being should be a healthy child. And a state cannot ensure that every child is healthy. Of course, no one can but what they can do is ensure that a child has a right of access to healthcare on a non-discriminatory basis. So it's a much more limited frame. So back to my statement and what does this mean for the digital world? A child might actually have very poor well-being and have no rights breached. If you take the example of a child who feels incredibly distant from peers by being left out of group chats or Snapchat, that child may have poor well-being but it's not a breach of their rights. The state has no responsibility to ensure that other children include them in their social circles, leaving bullying aside. And on the other hand, a child may experience a breach of his rights and yet have excellent well-being. In the digital world, the example here could be privacy. 
you know, a child may well have be on an app that's using their personal data in ways that breach their rights, but they don't care. They don't give a jot, you know, they feel really good about their lives, but the right doesn't, the obligation on the state doesn't change. The state still has to secure their rights, whether the child is feeling bad about it, the breach or not. Okay, so there are different frames. To move to the next slide, I was then asking myself, well, you know, what does a children's rights framework offer? Well-being, scholarship and practice, um, and then the converse. What does children's rights offer well-being? I think the magnet and the attraction of it when I, when I read well-being scholars using it is they like this legal basis. I think it really emphasizes entitlement and empowerment. Methodologically, it emphasizes that if you're developing measures, you should be including children in, in the development of those measures, but I'll leave that aside. But it's a powerful language. Michael Freeman calls it the moral coinage of, of human rights. And applied here, it actually lifts well-being and it gives it new spaces for advocacy nationally and internationally. On the other hand, if I was a well-being uh, researcher, I'd be very cautious about a child rights frame because obviously you're looking at something that is much narrower and much less ambitious. You're, you're tying yourself to restricted, state-authored and endorsed norms. What uh, one special rapporteur has said, states, um, these are the, the, the children's rights are what states have begrudgingly agreed. Okay, no more than that, not well-being for sure. So next slide, final slide. I then was thinking from my own perspective, what does well-being offer children's rights of value in a digital world? In 2004, I wrote a chapter in a handbook that's on the chat list. Um, about well-being and children's rights. And I think it was a bit harsh. <laughs> I was saying that well-being scholars sometimes use this to give pseudo-legal legitimacy to their approaches and are not actually substantively engaging with rights. I still think there's a danger there that when I look at some well-being scholarship that refers to rights, rights are taken and distorted and changed. And that matters to my field. So for example, if you take children's rights to um, you know, be included with other children to socialize, Sometimes Article 15 of the Convention, which is the right to freedom of association, is cited for that. Um, I think there are other parts of the Convention that actually mention the rights of the child that support it. But that particular right is a right to meet for a purpose. And that purpose is usually to affect social change. And that we change that, we change the nature of the right, and we take it out of its human rights framework, and that it becomes trouble. On the other hand, the positive thing I think is clearly, and we've seen it already in the presentations today, is the really significant methodological expertise in the well-being world that helps us understand children's lives. And we have a very old and aging Convention on the Rights of the Child written before a digital world. And the well-being research helps us understand how children's lives are so that when we interpret and apply that convention in the, these new circumstances, that we have a really robust body of evidence. So that's me. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Laura. And I'm glad you um, ended with um, some provocation. So <laughs> we have something, I think, to uh, discuss. Well, we have many things to discuss, in fact, because um, uh, as you also, I think, rightly point out, all kinds of fields have somehow converged on the question of well-being. Uh, and um, in, in seeking that normative legitimacy for making claims on governments, on all kinds of uh, organizations with the power to make children's lives better. A rights framing is one such legitimacy. I think in a way Richard um, Graham has access to a different one in thinking about um, the pain and problems and um, suffering that children might encounter in the digital world and more generally um, and uh, in fact, Kitty, in a, in a different um, frame, thinking about the, um, the, the, the problems of poverty. So there are different kind of legitimate bases from which I think uh, all of us um, are tempted uh, to take the research from, as it were, the, the evidence base into the question of advocacy and um, uh, calling for, for change. Um, so, so much to think about, and um, I think both uh, Richard and David also really kind of um, uh, helped us focus on those questions of measurement. Yes, there has been an enormous enterprise in trying to measure well-being. Um, as we all know, a policymaker um, pays no attention to making children's lives better in any way unless they have some evidence, and not only evidence, but that they can mark the improvement in children's lives as um, uh, as, as they make their interventions. And those measurement enterprises 
uh, always look back to the theory. What is it we're trying to measure? And at that point, uh, we see that there are some differences um, in the emphasis and the disciplinary insights that, that really um, enter into this, this field. Um, so I'm just checking our time and I know that uh, Maria is, is collecting uh, questions on the, um, on the Q&A. I, I think well, before I ask her to come in, I just wondered if any of you wanted to uh, say something and perhaps particularly the, 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 the first few speakers specifically about children, actually maybe in the right frame too. Um, when we think about well-being, are, is it a generic understanding of well-being um, or are questions of mental health on the one side or how we measure and think about um, cognitive, physical, emotional well-being on another. Perhaps what we need to understand is well-being, and it's the same for children and for adults. Um, what would be your kind of key point you'd want to say? This is different for children for this particular reason. Um, and I think Kitty might want to say something about play and love, actually. I don't know. I'm just thinking, what, what's the particular claim for thinking about well-being in relation to children or is it that they are simply the most vulnerable in society and merit um, attention for that reason? Can I just jump in there Sonia? Um, yeah. Also to agree with Kitty about food insecurity perhaps yeah. being more important it reminded me of that survey once that showed more people had access to a mobile phone than a, than a toilet but um, in, in terms of that, I think the developmental opportunities of childhood are different and mm -hmm. your life course can be changed depending on those opportunities being supported. And if well-being is an enablement of you, uh, I think Kitty put it again very nicely in terms of developing and, and sort of skills and abilities in a way that gives you that sense of purpose and preparedness, then it really does matter to focus on the earlier part of life, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Kitty, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'd echo, I think there are two reasons, and one is that that it that it that it's hugely important for the rest of life, and the second one is that it's where where children are less less autonomous in the sense that they they're much less they're much more dependent on the policies and things that are happening around them and for them, mm -hmm. and they have less agency in in terms of of uh, trying to drive their own way forward. Um, yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. The other thing, I just one more thing is that yeah. there's a political. I think there's also a political reason why we sometimes focus on children in term, in, the, in poverty debates. I think because it's much easier to get everyone to agree that for that same reason that I've just said they have less agency. It's much easier to get uh, uh, everybody to agree that this is something we should do something about, and that it's not children's fault that they're living in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. difficult circumstances. Yeah. I could. Um, I think now turn to the. Uh, question of what is coming in on the Q&A, if that will be good. And um, Maria, I can see that there's, there's, a, there's a list of questions that um, you've been keeping an eye on. Do you want to, um, thinking about time, give us a, a, a flavour of the kinds of questions people are, are raising and then maybe uh, focus on a couple that we can ask our wonderful speakers to address. Oh, and you're muted. Okay, yes, I am back now. Thanks everyone for the very positive uh, comments uh, and wonderful questions. Um, I've noted on several areas which are particularly interesting. Um, a number of questions address the issues of regulation and policy, especially in a context where we have multinational companies. So how does uh, this affect children uh, in, in different ways, in different contexts. Uh, there were a number of questions uh, related to how we measure uh, well-being, uh, especially again uh, with uh, having in mind the differences of children's experiences across different contexts and issues around how do we understand well-being in terms of measurement. Can well-being be negative? Uh, and can, can the, the scales even be gamified? So there were a, a number of interesting questions in, in this area. Um, a number of people asked questions related to rights um, and how can we put children uh, in the center of what we think about well-being, uh, how to use uh, well-being and digital technologies to improve uh, their rights to participation, for example. Um, and I think probably the biggest number of questions were around how to make it better 
for children. Yeah. So there were uh, issues related to uh, resilience, education, uh, what is the right approach, uh, whether to limiting technology or whether to, to think about how children uh, use technology. And of course, there was the issue arising maybe across all of this is about the social inequalities. So what is the impact of that uh, to children's yeah. well-being? So just to focus on um, a few questions, and I'll ask um, a few and then maybe several of the panel members can decide um, which ones they, they prefer. So one I really liked uh, is about putting children in the center of defining well-being. So how, how can we do that to ensure their rights? How can we make sure that our definitions of well-being and how we work with the notion um, actually uh, keep children in mind? Um, another interesting question that I want to pose to maybe some of the members of the panel is whether skills make a difference. This is part of the thinking how to make things better. Can we teach children better digital skills in order to, to promote their well-being uh, via their use of technology? Um, and social inequalities, uh, one of the questions was related to the effect of the existing inequalities um, and whether digital technologies can help to narrow this or uh, is it making things worse for children? I have more, so if we have time, I'll go back to the questions, but let's start with those. Brilliant, thank you very much, Maria. Um, who would like to go first? David, do you want to take the question of um, digital skills? Because that's something we've been- I, I'm kind of lost in these questions, I can say. What is exactly the question on digital skills? The question on digital skills was whether uh, we can teach children uh, to have better digital skills and whether this will have an uh, effect on their well-being, uh, whether uh, this might be a way of improving the situation and uh, making sure children have a better well-being by the, the way that they use technology. Uh, well, I think we don't have very clear answers at the moment mm -hmm. and uh, to give answers like that is actually the goal of the project Y Skills, which we already mm -hmm. mentioned. Uh, I don't think that there is, uh, car we, I think that current research didn't find very strong correlations or associations between directly between digital skills and well-being, uh, but uh, we could more think about the digital skills in the role of moderator between certain uh, online activities and the impact of on well-being. Uh, paradoxically, digital skills can play also the negative role depending on the motivation of the children, such as in the current analysis we found uh, there is direct effect uh, of uh, digital skills on uh, looking at harmful content at, and it seems that uh, having better digital skills mean you can also find uh, more harmful content because if, uh, if you are uh, looking for that for purpose, then you will find it more easily. So, so there are also uh, results like this. On the other hand, uh, sure, there is also the opposite, the positive uh, impact of digital skills that the children can better protect themselves against uh, dangers of the internet. They have technical skills to cope with certain risks or harms uh, and so on. So um, I think there is no simple answer on that question, uh, but um, I would say follow the Wise Skills project and read our reports. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, others, Laura, did you want to come back on the uh, what I think remains a, a, a thorny debate around well-being and children's rights? I'd like to pick up on the issue about invo involving children and how we yeah. measure and I think what child rights also brings, this could have been another presentation, yeah. is methodologically is involving children in these processes of developing measures so that what is measured is really relevant to children's lives and I think there was a question about making them child friendly yeah. and we would argue that they can only be child friendly when they're child authored, yeah, meaning authored with adults as well. So I think mm -hmm. child rights has something very um, strong to offer in terms of the methodological approach involving them more. But there were other questions about, you know, are there a right of access, which I would like, I meant to have a provocative question and is saying is, and, and other questions have come through, should children have a right to access the digital environment mm -hmm. remains a, a really problematic question because they currently don't. And mm -hmm. there is an issue about should they, could they, and would states mm -hmm. even acknowledge that given what I've said earlier. Mm -hmm. do, do you want to answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> so at the minute, 
they haven't unless it, it packs on their enjoyment of another right and kitty gives some really nice examples of that at the minute where they can't access yeah. if they're not accessing education on an equal basis then their right to education is breached and it just happens that it's the digital environment is the problem yeah. I, I i would love to discuss it more i think if it was being drafted today and children were involved in the drafting as they should have been yeah. it would be deemed sufficiently in children's interest that it places an obligation on another which is the foundation of all human rights and mm -hmm. there's an argument that it should, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, we'll see what it says. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, other responses, Kitty or Richard or? Yeah, Kitty? Yeah, I, I was really interested by the question about, you know, can digital technologies narrow inequalities? It's not all mm. doom and gloom. And I think that's, right. I think, I think we need more research on that, but it's a really good uh, question. And there's obviously ways in which surely there must be, there are ways in which that must be happening. So if you think about the importance of, resources in the home, books, the knowledge and in, 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 uh, cultural capital that parents, some ha parents have. Uh, and then as soon as you have access to a smartphone or a computer in school, suddenly the, the wealth of information that's out there and available to children that wouldn't have been 20 years ago. So mm -hmm. I sometimes think about when we, I get contacted at just at LSE, when I was a missions officer, you get contacted by people who've just been able to Google and think, what can I, and, and be out there looking. And I, and I think, well, once upon a time, that wouldn't, unless they'd had a careers advisor who'd put them on the right path, that wouldn't have been possible. Yeah. But um, I read to, I mean, there are clearly other ways in which that's, I don't think we can take that for granted. And there are other ways in which inequalities and, are. Right, and depressingly, what, what research show, does tend to show over and again is that when you provide any kind of resource, including a digital resource, in fact, uh, it can exacerbate inequalities. Uh, and this is probably what you'll think of in terms of relative and absolute poverty. It'll, it'll raise the opportunities for many, but the differentiation between those with less and those with more will nonetheless be sustained or, or, or even greater. And I think um, that, that makes such a challenge for those um, policymakers who are kind of looking at this whole area of research to think, how can we use this? Or if, you know, let's hope they want to use it to direct their research that's certainly why that or direct their policy that's certainly why the research gets done um, but whether um, uh, you know where we would particularly want to direct them I mean perhaps that's a that's a, a question for, for for a whole different webinar um, Richard I've now forgotten Maria's original question yeah no I, I, I has sparked <laughs> your interest well I thought Maria there was one suggestion about whether um, the use of technology may diminish well-being or, or have a negative impact in some way. And it just reminded me, which hasn't come up so far, about how the tech companies have been viewing digital well-being as a very crude estimation of screen time, I think. And you'll get your weekly sort of behavioral science nudge to tell you how much you've been on the screen and you then change your behavior accordingly. Um, and just how that is so disconnected with what you're saying, Laura, about being in touch with the actual experiences of young people and what matters in their lives. And, and I suspect, as we often find, it'll be nuanced with positives and negatives, but I think we, one of the hopes I would have out of this is if we move the, the thinking forward where we're not just leaving it to large tech companies to define what well-being of the digital age is and nothing as crude as simple screen time. Richard, I don't know if it makes sense in reflecting on um, your clinical experience to, you know, where, where, where do you put the digital on the scales of well-being? And in a way, this is a question I have for for everyone has digital kind of completely kind of reconfigured what what well-being can be and what or or has it made things so much worse that we are rightly as it were obsessed with the technology um i know it's fascinating because i was thinking of the nspcc sort of report today and i'm thinking where was food insecurity in that in terms of the impact and i was back to thinking about maslow as often the case at this time um I, I, I have come to the conclusion that someone's digital life is like their fingerprint or DNA, and you have to understand how the, the course of their life and their opportunities and whether use is disrupting that, um, because some of what happens in mental health is the way it kind of takes you away from opportunities for development and, and enhancing well-being, perhaps. Um, so 
I, yeah, I'm not sure I can, <laughs> probably a bit like David, I, I feel like I wouldn't want to give a simple answer at this point, mm -hmm. but recognize whether it's harmful content or mm -hmm. for some overuse, you know, really does into eat, eat into those other activities that would be good for you. Um, so yeah, uh, co complicated and the, I'm sure we'll continue that discussion. Mm, thank you. I can see that questions are still coming in. Um, Maria, I don't know that we have time for another round of questions, but perhaps you want to give us a sense of what, mm. what, what people are asking and what they're concerned with. And one thing I was going to say is that we will be keeping all these questions and um, mm. I think we might make it our homework to go away later and do our best to answer them and um, post a, a blog post or, or some such when we when we mm. eventually put this webinar online but um maybe there there yeah give us give us a sense of what's coming in and if there is anything uh if everyone is crystallizing on a particular burning mm. issue we could we could address it in our in our remaining minutes i think there's lots of burning issues one uh, of them uh, which is interesting for me is uh, our normative understanding of what well-being is uh, in that particular question that made me think about this is how long does well-being last? Is it 10 minutes? Is it a lifetime? Is it anything in between? Mm -hmm. So um, I think there's something about what we normatively expect um, our life to be like that a well-being somehow encapsulates uh, and reflects uh, in that. Um, other questions point to the current context, especially in relation to COVID. Uh, to be honest, I'm a bit surprised that we haven't addressed this even more, uh, but how, how does this situation change and whether um, access is a right and what is the role of digital technologies to preserving well-being uh, and mental health in, in a situation like this, which is very um, new to all of us, to say uh, the least. Um, other questions are related to, to resilience and uh, what can we do uh, to, to promote resilience and what, what is the right model, what, what is an effective way uh, to do that. So um, I'm finding it difficult to, to choose a last question, but maybe thoughts around uh, policies and what we can recommend uh, would be a good way to, to end this wonderful discussion. Yeah, and, and do we want, um, okay, so maybe that, that, that could be our last question. So if we could change one thing. <laughs> in the world of children's um, online lives or their digital lives, uh, what, would you, what would you, drawing on your experience, thinking about what the research told us or the, the ideas we've discussed, what, where would you put your money? What would you call for? Um, I might start with Laura. Because my answer is going to be different. Um, no? I, <laughs> I, well, you would agree with it, but it's, um, for me, from a rights framework, it would be the realisation of their rights, and in particular, their right to be heard, so that whenever policies, whether it's by the state or non-state actors, are designing children's digital environments, um, mm -hmm. that they involve children and they listen to children. And that's one way of realising all of children's rights is to listen to them and engage with them. So that's what I would change. I would make sure that happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Very good. Um, Kitty? Mine's easy. As long as, am I allowed to eradicate poverty? It's <laughs> good for rights as well. <laughs> well. Well, it's a sustainable development goal, so, um, and the deadline is coming up. Uh, yes, well, that's interesting. So your point is, in a way, it's, in fact, both of you, it's not exactly about the digital world that we need to change. It's the conditions of listening to children and the conditions in which they live that will change their well-being in a digital world and in all other regards yeah um david richard do you want to um end with a a call that is um perhaps a little more doable tomorrow though yeah. <laughs> it's doable tomorrow eradicating poverty perhaps not I have a message for parents. Uh, we should educate parents uh, not to be afraid of technology and uh, use less restrictions because restrictions are clearly uh, not much helpful and uh, decreasing digital skills. And then children uh, have m a less positive impact from the technology use. Oh. So I recommend parents to use uh, less restrictions and more speak with parents, uh, with children. Oh, perfect, thank you. Richard? I think it would be careers guidance. I often come across young people who, as David was saying, have exceptional digital skills and really don't know what to do with them. And currently, there's very little advice on how they could turn that to something positive and purposeful and, and then can run into difficulties. So 
something in that sort of education career space I think would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yep, very good. Okay, some, some interesting recommendations, I think some important ones and uh, incredibly fruitful and lively conversation about um, well-being. I think we'll all now use this concept um, a little more circumspectly um, and more variably. And um, uh, there is indeed much to reflect on. This is hardly going to be the end of our debate, um, but it is uh, the end of our webinar. <laughs> so I will um, call a halt at this point. I do want to very much thank our speakers. I would also like to thank the audience. And I'm only sorry that we didn't have time for uh, all of the wonderful questions that um, came in. I want to uh, thank the University of Akure for uh, technically hosting this um, webinar, which was much appreciated, and invite everyone to uh, keep an eye on the um, core uh, website. Um, and uh, we will be posting updates. We'll post the webinar on there in due course. And we will be holding our next webinar um, in a couple of months. So watch this space. And thank you very much.